Uh, we will be debate, debating on preventive cholecystectomy for asymptomatic gallstones. Uh, for chairing the session, I would like to welcome Dr. Ajay Sharma, Professor in HOT, Department of Surgical Gastroenterology at Mahatma Gandhi, Jaipur, and uh, Dr. V. A. Saraswat, Professor and Head of Department of Hepatology, Mahatma Gandhi Medical College. Okay, uh, I think uh, to chair this session, I have, uh, it's a uh, difficult and I think we'll have a lot of controversy, discussions beyond this debate, beyond this table also. So, uh, let's get alarmed and uh, started with this session in which uh, uh, we have two eminent personalities. One is uh, Dr. Usha Datta. And she's professor and head of the department gastroenterology at PGI Chandigarh, a medical colleague amongst the surgeons. And we have a surgeon of uh, who has always been a loved one during the conferences, Dr. Puneet Dhar, because who takes active participation into all such discussions. And the topic is definitely hot. And the topic is on should we do a Prophylactic cholecystectomy, preventive cholecystectomy. Yeah. So, can, uh, who will be presenting first? Ma'am will be presenting first. Okay, Dr. Usha Dutta, madam. I would request Dr. Puri there to please come. Uh, he can take the place over here because uh, at the end they have to fight and we have to mm -hmm. support. So, <laughs> it's the chairperson is making my task even more tough. As it is, the topic is highly hot and controversial. And on top of that, I have a surgical opponent. And he has a lot of surgical colleagues to support him. So I'm the lone gastroenterologist here. No, ma'am, uh, actually, you're, you're supporting the surgeons, and I'm supporting the gastroenterologist. So <laughs> it's, I think, a sign of maturity in such a conference that we are actually doing the reverse. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so preventive cholecystectomy for asymptomatic gallstones. Uh, the word preventive has, uh, was a term coined by Dr. Uh, Anubihari and Dr. Kapoor to indicate uh, prevention of gallbladder cancer. But however, in literature, the word prophylactic cholecystectomy is the more dominant one. And I'll touch upon both the components. So the stones which we see in the gallbladder are not just stones on the roadside, which we can ignore. They're inside a living human being, inside a gallbladder, which is a vulnerable organ. And we can see that the gallbladder is just two or three millimeters in uh, in its thickness. So any pathology which is going to be there is going to create a lot of havoc around it. So asymptomatic gallstones may be silent, but can be also sin. It can cause gallbladder cancer, acute cholecystitis, CBD stone, cholangitis, pancreatitis. And we manage this end of the spectrum, cholangitis, CBD stone, pancreatitis. And believe me, they are in our ICUs. And especially when these patients are pregnant, it is even more difficult to manage them and manage two lives at the same time. The relationship between gallbladder and gallstone is a two-way unhealthy relationship. A healthy gallbladder does not have gallstones, and uh, gallstones cause the gallbladder to, mucosa as well as the gallbladder itself to become unhealthy over a period of time. It's a cumulative chronic inflammation of the gallbladder, which is set up in a stage of patients who are having gallstones. So asymptomatic gallstone is a misnomer. It does not mean absence of disease. It just means absence of symptom. And we all know biliary colic can be of varying severity. Patients may have some adjuvant, somph, and various spices at home and some household remedies, and may just ignore this episode of pain as an acid peptic disease. So whole discussion is about whether the patient had one episode of pain lasting for about half an hour at any point of time, which the patient managed herself or went to the hospital. So that creates a problem. However, let us understand that all asymptomatic gallstones does not mean absence of disease. It reflects disease in the human being in the form of metabolic syndrome, hemolysis, and several other pathologies which are associated with stones. It reflects a gallbladder which is static, has a bacterial nidus. It reflects a bile which has imbalance in it. It reflects a bile which may be possibly infected. It reflects a gut which may be static and dysbiotic and inflamed. 
stones have bacterial colonies sitting on that. This is what our scanning electron microscopy in our patients with gallstones showed, especially cholesterol gallstones, which is the dominant stone in northern India, has a lot of these bacterial colonies sitting on them. 50% of these stones, when cultured, were infected. So in a study on 220 patients, one of our students just completed the study, 50% stones are culture positive. So these are not just innocuous stones sitting there. It is gram negative as well as gram positive bacteria sitting there. Second is the mucosa. 80% of the gallbladder mucosa in patients with protein gallstones undergoing cholecystectomy on culture. We put the tissue in the operation theater in Robertson Cook Meat Media and found 80% are culture positive. So it is not just a gallbladder which is just mildly inflamed with chronic cholecystitis. The stones also cause mechanical injury to the gallbladder. Large stones, heavy stones, rougher stones, harder stones, denser stones cause more inflammation and more likely to have metaplasia and dysplasia over a period of time. So we found metaplasia was detected also in only those through inflammation. So that means our gallbladder cancer goes through this pathway of chronic inflammation, metaplasia, dysplasia. So gallstones cause chronic cumulative mucosal injury to the gallbladder. It doesn't happen in one day, but happens over 20 to 30 years period of time. And it causes mechanical injury, bacterial injury, and chemical injury to the gallbladder, thereby setting up a stage of chronic inflammation, proliferation, metaplasia, and carcinogenesis. We also found when we looked at these 220 patients with gallstones and compared it with non-gallstone gallbladders, gallbladders which were resected during transplantation, gallbladders which were resected as a part of cholidocal cysts, gallbladders which were resected as part of routine whipples. Here we found that the gallbladders in gallstone patients were more often metaplastic, hyperplastic and more often had inflammation compared to the non-gallstone counterpart. So these stones in the gallbladder, even if asymptomatic, are not innocuous. Occasionally cause dysplasia also. So patients with gallstones have gallstones have bacteria around it, cause bacterial infection of the gallbladder wall and set up a stage for metaplasia, dysplasia and hypoplasia. We also in another study in 422 patients and compared it with non-gallstone controls and we found that 37% of the gallbladders are static. That means they have ejection fraction of less than 40% to a fatty meal. 74% are sluggish. That means the response to a meal is after one hour. And the static gallbladders more often had metaplasia. Thus, these gallbladders are also dysfunctional. Gallbladder emptying is poor, so the role in digestion is in inadequate. This may be the cause of dyspepsia in many of these patients. But the surgeons have a very simple solution to it. They have laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which removes this whole thing in entirety. It's a game changer for gallbladder diseases. It has lower morbidity, more patient friendly. And all our surgeons in institutions as well as who are senior in practice are well beyond the learning curve. And this, they have established that it's a reasonably safe procedure. So most of our guidelines have been made about 10 or 20 or 30 years behind time previously when laparoscopy was still emerging. And now there are set protocols and the cost is affordable and also comes under Aishman Bharat for the patient who can't afford. Early laparoscopic cholecystectomy has been found to be more cost effective than a delayed uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Another study in India has shown it's easier to do cholecystectomy in asymptomatic gallstone, less technically demanding, less conversion, as less complications. So the economics are also in our favor, telling us that it is cost effective. So who benefits? The patient benefits, the gastroenterologist benefits, the radiologist benefits, the surgeon benefits, and the healthcare system benefits by prophylactic and preventive cholecystectomy. In the patient, it reduces anxiety, reduces risk. For the gastroenterologist, it reduces unnecessary ERCPs and ICU care. For radiologists, it becomes very easy to handle the, give us a diagnosis, is it gallbladder cancer or no? And for the surgeon, it's a cakewalk. And for the healthcare system, reduces the burden on emergency and follow-up. But what is the risk? This is a very commonly talked about risk that is bile duct injury. But actually speaking, in a safe cholecystectomy, once the surgeons have done their job well, the chances of bile duct injury is very, very small in the present day. 
and you create controlled pain for a day or two after lab coli patient is home. It can rarely cause dysbiosis and the theoretical risk of increased chronic cancer. And it, uh, for the gastroenterologist, the risk is it reduces income. No more EUS and no more ERCPs. For the radiologist, no more specialized investigations. And for the surgeons, no more heroic surgeries to take out gallbladder cancer. And for the healthcare system, actually increases the safe routine procedures. In India, this is very important because India is the gallbladder cancer capital of the world and there's rising incidence of gallstones and most of the studies have come from the western countries. There are no Indian guidelines, no large cohort study from India. So India being the gallbladder cancer capital, Chile adopted the policy of prophylactic cholecystectomy. India is, likes to follow the North America and the Europe, so we are you know, not doing service to our own patients. So north, south, and east, west is a divide. This is a high incidence area, and you have a low incidence area, which is the west and the southern part of India. And gallbladder cancer is better prevented rather than treated. All of you have been treating gallbladder cancer and know it's far more easy to do a cholecystectomy and come out in gallstones than to go in with a CA gallbladder. And also it's poor chemo radiosensitive, poor surgical candidate, dismal prognosis, aggressive behavior, and a late presentation. 80% of the gallbladder cancer in India have gallstones and 80% of these gallstones are asymptomatic. So thus, this is a very important topic we should address. There is sufficient evidence by Bradford Hill criteria that gallstone is a risk factor for gallbladder cancer. I don't have time to go into all that. And it goes through this metaplasia pathway. In India, compared to the West, we have higher incidence of gallbladder cancer in patients with gallstones, possibly because we have a lot of cofactors, they are acting in an additive manner, and there are multiple risk factors. So that is why our equation is pushing us forward towards gallbladder cancer. And we have identified several risk factors like heavy metals, typhoid carriers, H. pylori, smoking, mustard oil, aflatoxin, and low socioeconomic status is somehow intervening into all of these components. And we have gallbladder stasis and genetic factors pushing the equation to the right. So in asymptomatic gallstones, we have an option of close follow-up. Definitely, these patients, once they come into us, they should be on close follow-up or preventive cholecystectomy. I have no doubt about that. In contrast to uh, smokers where you can't remove the lung, minimum you can remove the gallbladders and let the patient still survive a longer time. And we want to prevent clinical complications. The problem is we don't know which patient, when, how will develop a complication and what will be the status of the patient when the patient develops a complication can be mitigated at that time so the best is to do a safe cholecystectomy at a time when the patient presents to you when the patient is fit for it uh, the cumulative incidence of complications rises over a period of time and we have about 12 percent incidence of gallstones in a patient in a 20 year old Danish cohort study over a period of 20 years 12 percent will develop gallstones and what are the risk factors who will develop symptoms multiple stones stones more than one centimeter females younger age because they have a longer duration to live on this earth and older stones all these are independent risk factors a recent uh, cohort from Cleveland showed that 10% develop symptoms by 5 years, 20% by 10 years, and 30% by 15 years. So this is the figure I would like to leave you with. Preventing gallstones is a problem because in the Western studies, there are very, very low incidence. But in India, we do not know. We are doing an all India, India stone disease, which is carrying on on asymptomatic gallstone cohort. And I wish all of you can also enroll your patients into it. And preventing bile duct injury, as you see, is a very small incidence. And in safe hands, like our surgeons, I don't see any problem. <coughs> and there is ways to minimize and mitigate bile duct injury. Dr. Sadiq, Dr. Kabur, all of them have been working very closely on these things, how to ensure uh, reduction of bile duct injury in our country. So asymptomatic gallstones. I would think that anybody who has a stone which is more than a centimeter, stone volume more than 6 ml, stone duration more than 20 years, or is likely to live another 20 years, if there is associated polyp, porcelain, gallbladder, typhoid carrier, the host has a family history of gallbladder cancer, certain genetic mutations, hemolytic anemia or comorbidities, living in a high incidence area, pesticides, insecticides, contaminated environment, 
anomalous pancreatic ability junction, those who are having remote areas, patients in PJ come from uh, Himachal about, they have to travel about a whole day to reach you, a patient in low socioeconomic status, astronaut travelers to isolated locations, if it is there, no doubt cholecystectomy. If not, minimum a yearly follow-up of the radiology, looking at the gallbladder wall. Very important, the radiologists look at the stone, but they don't look at the wall. So wall is the very important thing, and also to assess the functional status. So preventing cholecystectomy, gallbladder cancer in India, gallstone is the target agents to take on. So these are actually mini time bombs. They are not just little stones sitting there. And you may not feel like James Bond to, you know, when you take a decade, but let us see if that bears out or not. It is, in fact, as ridiculous a premise uh, as a fascist one that uh, many terrorists belong to a certain ethnic group, you know, Hitler believed that, hence that ethnic group must be radically eradicated. So do, uh, do, you, do you really feel it should be as, we, as surgeons, we should be as fascist? Is gallbladder cancer proportional to stones? Western population has shown that its stones are extremely common environmental factors. Uh, yesterday, our friend from uh, uh, Bethesda actually pointed out that it's interesting that on two sides of the Andes, the Mapuche, same Mapuche ancestry actually, so there's definitely some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, evidence of uh, environment as well. On the uh, Peru side, it's very low, the same ancestry. On the, uh, on the Chile side, it's, it's much higher. Uh, likewise, from the Bolivia and uh, Chile side. So bile from Chileans have fo was found to have a higher mutagenic activity. So are we really looking at the stones or the entire uh, bed and uh, other factors which cause it? And finally, we come to if there is a if, if this is the cause of the whole uh, theory rests on this chronic inflammation business. So we must be like in in colon cancer uh, when we are looking at it, we do see all phases of low grade dysplasia, high grade dysplasia. All of you have read biopsy reports of gallbladder. How many times have you seen that? It's only when, you know, uh, uh, some very high fi studies actually have done studies, and most of those uh, studies are adjacent to the, uh, 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 the cancer itself where they've shown all those changes, not in, uh, you know, uh, uh, native uh, 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 gallstones alone. So uh, no multivariate analysis could prove that uh, that size, number, patient age, all these are direct risk, risk factors, although univariate showed them. And in the multivariate, is only symptoms. So asymptomatic, whether we need to, uh, you know, attack it like the enemy. Another study shows that many of these metaplastic changes actually are seen in microlithiasis, just like pancreatitis. Uh, you know, you may not see uh, uh, macro stones there, the whole biliary sludge concept. We don't know whether, the, you know, uh, it's a, my, and we're try, we, because of looking because of this, we're actually attacking the uh, macro lids, which we are seeing on the uh, ultrasound. Likewise, no, you know, you, in the tumors, in early tumors, late tumors, you find a whole range of these changes, the micro, uh, satellite instability, all the other immunistic chemical alterations. Uh, they were found in uh, early cancers, late cancers, and in the area adjacent to that, uh, but none were found in the chronic cholecystitis group alone, w without any of these changes. In addition, many of these studies have shown uh, from Japan that the period required to progress from dysplasia to advanced cancer would be around 10 to 15 years. So we must be seeing in that duration some evidence of that uh, uh, change which uh, uh, we fail to see. So a dose response relationship with increased risk, with increased length of residence was shown in this. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Shraddha, for pointing out this article from the Tata, uh, you know, the epidemiology department. And the risk persisted even when they migrated to a low risk region, but it was, st it was uh, you know, still high. Uh, so definite role for environmental genetic factors rather than just the presence of stones. Uh, it's very interesting that all these e epidemiological data are actually, you know, there is no good raw data from India. Each one is actually, there are three main articles which are being uh, quoted. Uh, Madam in her review has actually quoted this article, which is based on a single patient who died of a uh, adenocarcinoma. This whole Grepco experience was based on one guy who had a cancer and he was also symptomatic. So we could wait for the patient to be symptomatic. So this is actually, uh, you briefly, quickly flashed it, uh, this particular article. This is, uh, you know, 
clearly addressing the problem that we have, whether it should be a prophylact expectant or uh, uh, surgery. Uh, it's a decision analysis, Ransohoff, and clearly showed the prophylactic cholestectomy actually slightly decreased survival. So we don't have that evidence. So is removing gallbladders with stones just a convenient scapegoat? You know, we have this uh, uh, famous adage that uh, when a surgeon is faced with an unfamiliar situation, he ends up doing what he's most familiar with. And uh, I'm reminded of this time and again in various situations. Uh, if we didn't have any commercial advantage, like the improved quality of life of all the people that you showed, uh, so there is a conflict of interest. Are we meeting targets? Are we improving the surgeon's quality of life? So uh, the f interesting thing is the entire target population you showed was the lower socioeconomic status, and and we are targeting the uh, you know uh, easier, not at risk TPA patient who mainly because he has the insurance cover. So. Uh, Argument against prophylactic cholestectomy for asymptomatic, the natural history of asymptomatic stones show a low lifetime risk of turning symptomatic, forget about the, the cancer itself, Com that is the rate of complications. Most do not present with complications for the first time and they present with minor complications, pain and all first. Uh, surgery can be done when they, the moment they get symptomatic, it's just like scaring every hernia into saying you're going to die of strangulation. Uh, and none, you know, in all these uh, uh, cohort studies, nobody died of gallstone-related issues. So what are the downsides of removing a gallbladder? The overall mortality risk, this is from Strasbourg, overall mortality risk of cholestectomy is actually 0.14 to 0.5%. Uh, there's a definite concern of inducing, forget about the biliary injury, of con inducing post-surgical symptoms in some actually, increasing GERD, increased diarrhea, especially in IBS patients. Uh, there's a concern of right-sided colon cancer and other cancers after 50, several years after uh, cholestectomy. The financial implications are staggering. Ma'am, it is not 10,000. It is, uh, it, the cost estimated is four times that of conservative treatment. Uh, at, in the UK, the estimate was four million pounds for 10,000 asymptomatic patients. Even in Chile, they're doing it as an effort, you know, concerted effort to try and get the, uh, the problem down with, with such a high proven incidence of high gallbladder cancer. So complications are serious in 2.6% and biliary injuries, we like to quote the figure of 0.2 to 0.3, but the latest uh, guidelines from the Emergency Surgery Society a uh, couple of years back actually still shows it at 0.4 to 1.5%. So uh, are there any, you know, if we didn't, if we could actually take it out, we always say try to take it out without bile spillage. Nobody does it intentionally. It's, it's as high, this is from, uh, from Anna's, it's a Canadian paper, so I actually looked at several papers from Pakistan, India, uh, and I found a very high incidence, which, you know, I thought it's probably overstated, but I found, you know, several uh, registry data, which is probably the truth, uh, with so many, uh, you know, 115,000 uh, cholecystectomies, 82 incidental gallbladder cancers, 67% bile spillage. So here is a model where, which is possibly the only place where equipoise could have been achieved because only target is incidental, you know, we are not sure whether you can prevent future cancers, but this is the only place where you can pre prevent an incidental cancer. And, you know, in more than half of them, you're going to actually, we, we heard since morning, what could happen if there is a, 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 a spillage. So there's an independent predictor of short disease-free survival. So a systematic review uh, has shown there's increased risk of cholangiocarcinoma, uh, uh, if you do extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma with uh, cholecystectomy, increased risk of pancreatic cancer, increased risk of colorectal cancer, particularly right-sided colorectal cancer, uh, colonic cancer, increased risk of prostate cancer. So if you're we if we doing it only for preventing a, one cancer, which we are not even sure of, I think we should be clear that a whole host, so it's not as innocuous, removing the gallbladder can change the gut microbiota, what actual changes that could have in us, we don't really know. I mean, since all of you wax eloquent on the microbiota, I, I wanted you to leave it, leave it with that. So I've heard this emotional statement from a lot of people, uh, including the first uh, iteration of the Jaipur Surgical Festival. Uh, if you've seen the number of patients I've seen with advanced con cancer gallbladder, I had one patient whom I advanced, uh, advised against surgery, but he later came to me with cancer gallbladder. Isn't it remarkable that there are very few of us who've seen a gallbladder cancer in someone who's had stones earlier, but every single member in this room all have seen innumerable biliary injuries. When I was doing my 
MCH dissertation, I collected 100 cases of uh, biliary injuries in a single year, and that's documented. Uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, we need to worry about this versus, uh, you know, uh, putative. I agree, opasa uh, cholestectomy may be acceptable. It has some potential benefits. This is if you're doing surgery for any other reasons, because there could be post-op symptoms of cholecystitis or something else which might cause a confusion. Uh, and there's likely a very small incremental risk from the gallbladder itself. Uh, provided even in this case, the risk should still be explained and not trivialized and definitely a hysterectomy had asymptomatic gallstones. I sent her to my own friend and the guy is telling me that she's got symptomatic. So, I mean, I know that she's asymptomatic, but he's convincing me that it's symptomatic. So, it, it is a disease that we have uh, and, you know, uh, we look at retrospectively, uh, you know, PGI used to have uh, autopsy data. Uh, in the oral cholecystograph era, we never did a single asymptomatic. So we can compare the incidence of gall, you know, gallbladder in the autopsies then and after the introduction of uh, ultrasound. I know now we've done away with the autopsy, but we still would have that data uh, with the pathology department. In, in addition to being prospective and retrospective, we need to be introspective. Would I like my own gallbladder removed if I had asymptomatic stone, even by a specialist and certainly not by any run-of-the-mill uh, surgeon? So let us start with all habits, hand on heart. How many of you put on a seat belt when you came here uh, to this venue? I've seen every single person not put on a seat belt at, in the, when you're seated at the back because it's not legally required. Uh, even though we know it's going to be fatal, it's been shown to be fatal. How many of us have told uh, you know, more than 10 people that not to smoke, which has been shown to have so many things, but we are ready to you know, advise a, a, a colleges technique. So let's, let's uh, first start with things which are proven before we do this. This was a book which I, one of the first medical thrillers I read in medic, when, the moment I joined medical school, Coma and this one. Uh, this is about a gynecologist who's called you know, a hotshot guy called Goldfingers, where he's uh, uh, got the best results for gynae oncologist with in ovarian tumors because he, any doubt of a malignancy, even a borderline report on frozen, he just removes the uh, ovary. And uh, you know, the, I, I won't reveal because I think it's an interesting one. So how the whole thing changes, and I hope we're not making the same error of judgment here. I thank you for a patient listening. After. Uh Two senior people talking on the controversial uh, uh, discussion. Uh, since we are all surgeons, I think can we uh, just a have a raise hands at how many will like to operate a asymptomatic gallbladder for prophylactic cholecystectomy? Those who would like to operate may raise your hand. For prophylaxis of cancer, you mean? For prophylactic of cancer. For prophylaxis of cancer only. Prophylactic cholecystectomy, asymptomatic gallstone. So you, we are one, two, three. And how many will not operate? Oh, so we have so we have a majority to would not operate. So ma'am, you still have a but less yeah. number with you, but you are strong. So see, so uh, what we can do is. Uh, uh, she gets a rebuttal for. Uh, no, yeah. I think I should get a rebuttal before you put it to vote. <laughs> so uh, the I agree with a lot of things which you have said. However, uh, in India, the scenario is very different. In India, the, for the number of gallstones that we see, we see more gallbladder cancers. So we cannot take Western data. We don't have a decent cohort study in India to advise us what is right and wrong. So possibly it's not the stones, ma'am? <laughs> no, no. Uh, so uh, stones are the thing which set the stage. All the cofactors are actors. In the West, the stage is empty. It is just the stones. In India, we have the stones which have set the stage, and on top of that, we have aflatoxins, we have S. typhi, we have H. pylori, we have bacteria, we have uh, stasis, and a lot of things. So I think uh, Indian gallstones are different. The second thing is this, uh, this adage that pain will happen before the patient becomes symptomatic is based on one study by Grepko, which showed a few patients which developed symptoms and they had pain. So I don't think that is true for gallbladder cancer because we see a lot of asymptomatic gallstones along with gallbladder cancer. And the third point is that UK, you're saying that the cost of cholecystectomy is higher. But they have a free health care for other things. All our patients are coming with out-of-pocket expenditure from wherever they are coming for a follow-up. And all these patients, you would agree, definitely require a follow-up. So coming back and forth itself is an expensive 
thing. And again and again we come to this bile duct injury. Bile duct injury in asymptomatic stone is very very low. In symptomatic complicated stone, yes, I agree. But again, this is in the surgeon's domain that you have to ensure that you can do a safe cholecystectomy for these patients. So, that I leave it for the surgeons to ensure safe cholecystectomy. And bile spill, I don't think, has an important role in asymptomatic stone, definitely in incidental gallbladder cancer. And the pathologists often don't report it because not all pathologists diligently look at it. They take a small piece and they say chronic cholecystitis, mild or moderate, and close the story. But if a diligent pathologist is looking at it, we are finding 47% are having metaplasia. This mean age is 40, 45 years. So in this age group, if we are already having metaplasia, we are already marching in that direction. So uh, I would think that if your mind doesn't know, your eyes will not see. A decent pathology of the whole strip from fundus to neck and carefully doing pass alchian blue staining will pick up more metaplasia. So, we are in a high risk region, we have to risk stratify, we cannot just go out saying that, uh, you know, asymptomatic gallstones go home and sleep. That's no, not at all. So, they need to know, but the moment they get symptomatic, so all the studies have shown that it's the symptomatic ones which get the cancer at least. I agree with you that there might be an odd uh, asymptomatic one which can present with pancreatitis or, you know, cholangitis alone. But uh, to present with cancer straight away is very rare. Even though with the Grepco thing, it is only a single patient. Yeah, uh, I will not go yeah, further. I I'll just think, leave it on that. Yeah, I think uh, the both the... Uh, mm, uh, proponents and the antagonists and the protagonists have done a very thorough job and a complete review uh, and I think we've already had a show of hands so there's very little else left to be done uh, by the hall except to say that I think much of the arguments that have been put forward are in the absence of any data whenever we talk of data we say we don't have this information we don't have that information 80 percent you said there are plenty of studies that say only 60 to 70 percent of um, gallstone of uh, cancers have associated gallstones. So, 30 percent or more of gallbladders without calculi develop cancer, which uh, again whether you'd use it as an argument for or removal of every single gallstone, one doesn't really know. So, I think possibly this is one situation which is ripe for something that we could do a mathematical modeling of the benefits and the risks. We know cholestectomy rates what is the NNT, how many numbers of gallbladders need to be removed to prevent one gallbladder cancer, the number needed to treat, those numbers can be calculated. The complications of uh, cholestectomy have already been alluded to and possibly in our country where this is a utopian thought that data will emerge in the last 40 years since I have entered the field of gastroenterology, this is an ongoing debate and no data really have emerged which can on the basis of which you can strongly argue for or against. So maybe uh, in the way you say to Usha and uh, Puneet, uh, you guys can do a kind of a modeling study at least to tell us what the numbers say, what would be the risks of this approach vis-a-vis -vis the other. I think yes. I see Professor Kapoor is standing on the mic. So um, I would again request my young colleagues here, things which we haven't done as Dr. Saraswat said in last Absolutely. 30 years, you can do. Some information is very easy to get. All patients with gallbladder cancer, you know whether there are stones or there are no stones. The only thing you have to ask them is whether you have had history of biliary colic in the past or not. That will tell us that in out of 100 patients with gallbladder cancer, how many have stones and how many of these were symptomatic stones and how many of these are asymptomatic stones. Simple clinical data. Second, the point which Usha made, we all are doing cholecystectomies or asymptomatic gallstones for one reason or the other. All these gallbladders which are truly asymptomatic when cholecystectomy is done, they need to be pooled, a detailed pathological study. If a significant number, we can define what will be a significant number, in my opinion even 5 would be a good number. If even 5 out of 100 show pre-neoplastic changes, I think cholecystectomy would be just Yes, uh, just to invite the whole audience here, let everybody know that we are doing an India stone disease, uh, disease cohort. This is on asymptomatic gallstone, it's an ICMR funded study in which we will be enrolling 3,000 asymptomatic gallstones in the next one year and following them up for a 10 year period. 
so this will be the basis of the cohort study it's already started over 13 centers and i'm also getting now an isg task force on this so that everybody can use this website and put in their asymptomatic gallstone and then Dr. Kapoor's dream will be fulfilled of having a cohort of asymptomatic gallstones and anybody who's operating an asymptomatic or a, a symptomatic gallstone in that sense can put in their data in and we will have a online web-based calculator to you know tell us what's the risk for a patient. I have another proposal which I've, I've discussed with Professor Vinay and uh, uh, Piyush as well earlier uh, is that uh, some of these asymptomatic gallstones what I do is I get a HEDA done if the patient insists on getting surgery if I'm not sure of the symptoms it's atypical symptoms I get an endoscopy done if that's clear I get a HEDA done if the the emptying is abnormal uh, for the atypical uh, patients I do the cholestectomy and actually all of them have had uh, improvement in the in the symptoms for the uh, asymptomatic ones if it is uh, abnormal uh, I tell them they have the option of doing it, but if they are not doing it, I'd like to, uh, you know, prospectively enter them into a database. And the ones which are normal, pos it's possible that we might actually, so uh, the entire cohort of uh, post cholestectomy syndrome, my feeling is, happens in people where we remove a functioning gallbladder. If it's already non-functioning, probably it's not, you know, uh, we don't know the, uh, I'm aware there's no data, that's why I didn't put it in my slides. I can see Vivek uh, shaking his uh, uh, head vigorously, but, uh, you know, uh, it's just a proposal because I don't think we look enough at functional studies. We are hell-bent only on anatomy, you know, only on looking at shadows. Sorry, uh, we did a study on 422 uh, gall stones and we found that more than 50 percent are static gallbladders and these static gallbladders more often have metaplasia and so we, they're more likely to have so that's my theory that they're so more likely to have so it's probably these should be removed uh, you know if it, if if we have to choose from within them and then we we'll know whether you know for chili also that's a good thought uh, one minute. Uh, so, uh, as i said for incidental we need to really define what know what is asymptomatic gall, gall stones so a lot of it is underreported. So there is no strict criteria to tell what really is asymptomatic, like Dr. Dutta has said. And other thing you also mentioned that when they become symptomatic, the causal relationship is much more to develop gallbladder. But I think it's a whole process of time period from asymptomatic to what we perceive as symptomatic and then proceeding to this thing. In Tata, when we operate upfront gallbladders, I would say in almost 50 to 60 percent, we do find stones, definitely. And fourthly, I got my gallbladder operated for asymptomatic. <laughs> That's why you raised your hand, actually. So I have I have polyps, and I'm not getting it done because we've collected hundred polyps and we published as well hundred polyps. So polyp is ultrasound detected polyps, uh, and not a single one turned out to be malignant. Most of them turned out to be actually stones. The ones who operated. Sir, have we defined the CHGB yeah. data? We don't have a defined CHGB data because. We ourselves know that 80 percent are actually not operated, which means out of the 80 percent, the attrition to which the data will not be available will be more than 50 percent of them. Because so I know, and I like Bahesh said, he's on, uh, only 50 percent. So I know the the literature data is 80 percent. All the all the gallbladder uh, cancers, I probably have the least experience from all of you in CAGB in this room. Uh, all the ones I've done, uh, most 80 percent didn't have a stone. So I don't. Know, so even uh, uh, you know, he, uh, Shivan is saying and. After I've told this to a lot of my uh, colleagues, they've started telling me, yes, now they actually didn't find. So I don't know where this 80% stone has come. So I really challenged that. And he's saying 50%, so he's, uh, so, so. Uh, Sir, my concern is less about the 80% association of stone and more about not having a complete data on the gallbladder cancer itself. Because In the advanced, sense? advanced stage malignancy comes to each and one of us. And this is something which we are treating, we are on tertiary level. But many of them will be sent back immediately once they are found to have a... So you are saying a registry, we should have a yeah, registry, yeah, yes. So I first think we have to have a gallbladder cancer Dr. data. Dr. Puneet wanted a registry robot. for delivery injuries I think, I think and this discussion will go on. Let's stop that Dr. Puneet and Dr. Sir. But I think Dr. Vinay Kapoor needs to plan a full half day session for prophylactic cholecystectomy in the next Jaipur surgical week. There are just too many views and too strong thoughts. but. Probably the bottom line is what Usha has started, the India Stone Study, and probably other centers should pull in. Objective, characterized, identified data need to be gathered, and then the debate becomes meaningful. Otherwise, it's more opinions and views and thoughts being debated rather than published data. Thank you very much for a very exciting session. Thank you both.
the only concluding remark will be that both have done an extensive work to present to to support their statement and i think most of the audience was not having all this data matlab whatever we have read something was lacking or the other i think we have learned a lot from both of these presentations thank you thanks a lot